everyone take your hymn book and we'll turn to number 502 502 and let's all stand as we sing stand up for Jesus 502 stand up stand up for Jesus ye soldiers of the cross Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall he lead. Till every foe is vanquished, and Christ is Lord indeed. Stand up, stand up. why I don't sing in the choir. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. All right, prayer requests. We want to pray for Bud. He's doing great. Jeannie, you okay? Yes. Charles, your eyes looking a little better, yes, buddy. Yes, getting some better. And Raymond, he had the same treatment done also, didn't he? We want to pray for that situation there. Um, 
Who else was there? Back here, this group that came in today, hallelujah. Yo, Janet, you doing better? <laughs> there you go. John, you doing okay? Huh? What? John, you doing okay? Um, yeah, I'm working it out. Yeah, that, you know, I don't know when it starts to get gray in the beard there. It's, yeah, yeah, I'm working on it. <laughs> you ladies don't have to worry about that, right? Getting gray in the beard. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Oh, my goodness. Amen. Christy, how's your mom and dad? Okay, good deal. And you, you're, I see you're here. You told me I, I, I pity you. I don't even care. And this guy here has been through the roughest parts of it. I can only imagine what you're going through. They say it's almost like a having a baby, something like that. Charles had a baby? No. <laughs> oh, I got that one in, didn't I? <laughs> he had a st <laughs> kidney stones, right? Oh, Lord, 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 let help us, Lord. <laughs> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time of fellowship. The church wouldn't be the church if it weren't for laughter, and you, uh, you give it to us, God. You want us to lift it up to you also, God. We thank you for uh, the time that we have now to come worship you. You're a holy and righteous God, and you're our God. And God, uh, we realize that we're not and that we sin against you. God, we ask you right now to cleanse us and drive back all the opposing thoughts coming in our minds. And God... Uh, Accept what we're about to do right now to honor you and to praise you. We do pray for the ones that are sick, touch their bodies, and the ones that are traveling, uh, give them mercies as they travel. And then leadership in our country, Father, we want to pray for them. Help us in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, take your hymn book again and turn to 491. 491. I'd rather have Jesus, 491. <clears throat>
Christians. I'd rather have Jesus and let him be than to be the king of a vast array or be held in sin straight sway. I'd rather have Jesus than Number 508, 508, <clears throat> His way with thee, 508, would you live for Jesus and be always pure and good, would you walk with him? We'll take this evening's offering. Brother Raymond, would you pray for us, sir? Father, we rejoice knowing that you are mighty and powerful and you're able to handle all our situations as we bring them before you. Thankful again for the opportunity to glorify you with our tithes and offerings and let it be used for the glory and honor of our God in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
10 is where we'll be reading tonight, John chapter 10. We're just going to read about half of the chapter down through verse 21, and we'll get the rest of it Sunday morning. John chapter 10, and here the Lord is speaking, and the red letter parts of the Bible are not more important than the others, but I always like to know when Jesus is speaking and what he's talking about. And so we're going to get a bit of that tonight. Chapter 10, verses 1 through 21. And why don't you folks help me out tonight? Okay, everybody volunteered at once here. So I'll volunteer you. I'll get the first verse, and then we're going to go around this way. That's This time, Charles, Beth, and around that way. And if you're croaking or can't speak or whatever, just pass it on to the next person. All right, down through verse 21 is where we're going. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. When he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of the stranger. Whoso will take heed unto them, of them do not what things they will do to them. Then Jesus said unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the There was a division, therefore, again among the Jews for these sayings. And many of them said, He hath a devil and is mad. Why hear ye him? Others said, These are not the words of him that hath a devil. And a devil opened the eyes of the blind. Amen. And we have just heard the very word of God. Amen. Anything you want to point out from this passage that you caught your attention as you go through it? And, of course, you know, if you don't, Bob and I always have something going. In, in this passage, uh, in verse 7 and 11, are two of the I am's in the book of John. There's seven of them where the Lord Jesus himself says, I am. And the one, he says, I am the door of the sheep in verse 7. And then I am the good shepherd is said several times, but it's there in verse 11. There's... Um, what does he mean, I am the door of the sheep? Well, you have to know a little bit about keeping sheep in the time in which Jesus lived here on the earth. And many times there was basically a corral that was in the shape of a letter O, and it had a little slit in it just big enough for the sheep to go in and out. And at night, the shepherd was the door to that corral. And he laid in the opening, and no one got out, and hopefully no one got in in the process 
So he is the way to safety and the haven of heaven for us as believers. And then he is the good shepherd, and the comparison is made that there are some bad shepherds. It's amazing. Uh, for example, if uh, you had felt the need to hire a security guard to be at your house uh, at night when you were gone, and so the guy comes and stays at night while you're gone, but if somebody threatens the house, most likely that security guard's going to leave, okay? Because it's not his house, and he's not willing to lay down his life for it. Where you would go out and. Uh, Instead of you feeling led, that person's going to feel led in their back. Uh, there's a difference in who owns the sheepfold, and he is a good shepherd. I'm glad he is our shepherd. Now, by the way, let's think about one other thing, and don't let this rot your socks because it, some people can't handle this. Look at verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd does something. Verse 15. As the Father knoweth me, even so I know the Father, and I do something, Jesus said. Lay down my life for the sheep. Now, what he is saying is he is making atonement for those he knows are the sheep. And there is a real sense, though the death of Jesus Christ was sufficient to provide atonement for the whole world, it's only efficacious to those that believe, those that he already knew who would believe, and in fact, he calls them and us the elect. And it doesn't say, I've got a big note written here right by this, this passage does not say he laid down his life for the goats. He laid down his life for those who would be saved, and he already knew who they were. And I'm glad that salvation is that clear and precise in the mind of God. Now, yes, you and I have to respond, receive, and believe. But there's nothing that we do about salvation, and we weren't even thinking about it until the Holy Spirit moved us to consider our own woefulness and sinfulness. And I'm glad that uh, the Father loves me, and he loved Jesus, verse 17, therefore does my father love me. Why does he love Jesus? Because he laid down his life. I like finding repeated things in a passage of scripture as well as list. All right, anything else from anybody? John? The one that laid down his life, yeah. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Kathy? Verse 18. Yeah. And he, he willingly, of his own will, died. Uh, he turned off the life, and then the second end of that verse is is powerful too and I have the power to take it again now I'm going to live again when I when I die here I will live again but it won't be because I got me up it's because Christ will get me up Janet I see there you go It, um, you know, there's been several opinions about what's going on. And at this moment, right here in this passage, he's talking to Jews. And the other fold could be the Gentiles that are not yet brought into the fold. Um, this is still, we're still in the gospel, which are under the Old Testament law, although Jesus is teaching and training. And then Acts is the transition book. And then we have the Gentiles that actually come into the family. There are some who would teach that these are the Old Testament saints. Uh, I think the first is probably the better answer here. Um, while you were asking, um, I quickly turned to uh, Dr. MacArthur. Not of this fold. This refers to the Gentiles who will respond to his voice and become part of the church. In Romans 1.16, Jesus' death was not only for the Jews, but also for non-Jews whom he will make into one body called the church, but that hasn't officially taken place at this point in the book of John. 
So that's I sort of lean to that direction. Mm -hmm. Verse 4. Well, what do you like about it, young lady? Yes. Yes. There's a difference between sheep in this hemisphere of the world and the ones over in the eastern hemisphere of the Middle East. Sheep in this part of the earth uh, are driven. But to make the wonderful analogy of the relationship between Jesus and us, the sheep in the Middle East are led and they follow the shepherd. And it's a wonderful picture of the relationship we ought to have with Christ. And that's, in fact, that's what he's talking about, is us. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. No, that's fine. Janet's been high a few days on prednisone, so she hasn't slept in three days, three or four days. I had it one time for about four days, and I was just. But it's wonderful stuff while it's working. All right. Anything else here, Dr. Bob? I think they got it all here. And I, I love the end of verse 10. I come that they might have life. And, you know, even right now, uh, the brevity of life, the horrors of dealing with uh, illness and sickness uh, in this life has been real up front in my face this week with my mother. And uh, here's somebody we've loved and now totally out of control at times. And it'll just be good for her to check in on the other side and I don't want to lose her but at the same token I don't want to keep her here like this either and uh, so just pray for her and uh, pray for the boys uh, actually it's a wonderful thing I was telling Kathy in fact she's dealing with some similar things with her mother um, but with four brothers uh, that are still living one gone on to the other side we've met on zoom a couple of times this week and absolute unanimity working together and uh, I am thankful for those good men and so we hope uh, we'll be able to help her and let her think she's still in charge <laughs> but y'all pray for us Lord thank you for this wonderful chapter and what it can mean to us we thank you that our salvation is not some little flash in the pan idea but something planned out and as Jesus died he was literally given his life for those that are his sheep. And Lord, we know that he's not willing that any should perish. He wants all to come to repentance, but not all are willing to come to repentance. And so very clearly our Lord going to the cross made it clear that he wanted to see the sheep receive to himself one day. And we thank you for his love for us, the love of the Father for him. And we thank you for putting it down so we could read it and understand it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. By the way, my friend Ricardo in Cuba is impressed with y'all asking questions and giving answers and giving statements uh, as we read the scripture. Uh, and he and several others there in Cuba are, are watching us every week and they are enjoying the scripture reading. Amen. Amen. Okay. Take your hymn book again and turn to 515. 515. Let's stand again as we sing. It's a short song, not very long at all. All glory to Jesus, 515. All glory to Jesus, be God and of God. The great I am is He. Creator, sustainer, but one. Oh,
just witnessed a nice little piece of music, a coda at the end of a song, and uh, no, it's not something you get in your nose, coda, or your chest, coda. All right, John chapter 17 is where I'd like you to turn tonight, and we're going to do a whirlwind tour through the priestly prayer of Jesus Christ before he went to the cross to die for your sins and for my sins. I, I like to question people about prayer. And quite honestly, Gary Miller, when I'm in his presence and listen to him talk about prayer, I feel so insufficient in prayer. And yet here is a man who has spent an adult lifetime behind his own father spending an adult lifetime speaking primarily on the subject of prayer as they've ministered. Gary ministered in Africa for a while, and then he pastored here in the United States. He was seminary professor at Luther Rice Seminary in Florida for a number of years. And now he's, uh, even though he is, quote, retired, I think he is 70 or 71, he is still working for the American Renewal Project. And he is supposed to have arrived in North Carolina yesterday or today. And uh, I wish I could tell you where he's gonna be staying, but I can't tell you where it gets out. But it's amazing who stepped up and volunteered to let him have their house that they don't need right now. I'll tell you later when we're not broadcast into the world. All right, I want us to look at this chapter, and I want you to understand in this chapter, I really like this because this is his high priestly prayer before he goes to Calvary, and Jesus prays for three uh, groups of people, or two groups of people and one person. In verses 1 through 5 in this chapter, you find that the Lord is actually praying for himself the human Jesus is praying for the human Jesus now just let that settle in your mind he was human in all points like as we are and a lot of times in the morning while I'm still trying to get these eyes to function and get my brain started pre-coffee I mean the coffee does help it's the drug of choice for me book a book a book book I loved that percolated coffee. In fact, uh, the other morning, I, right now we're doing Folgers in your cup. And I pulled, I'm doing Folgers in your cup. Pulled out the real red plastic thing and uh, put, took the lid off, put a big tablespoon over there. One huge tablespoon gets me four cups of coffee. And, and the last thing I said to that spoon of coffee, it's time to meet your maker. Okay. And got it percolating, and it still takes me a while to wake up. But many times, just standing in the shower, I think, okay, I might as well get clean spiritually, too, while I'm in here, and I'll talk to the Lord in the shower. Uh, I had a professor at Bob Jones, Dr. Jesse Boyd. He's been with the Lord for 25 or 30 years now. And Jesse was one of my favorite professors. He pastored a church in Greenville, uh, the Mount Calvary Baptist Church, uh, a he was a professor in the pulpit at his church, and he had a few little quirks about him. He would only announce song numbers one time because you're supposed to be paying attention. Amen. We ought to pay attention and get the hymns down. And I know sometimes we miss things. And when you took a quiz or a test with him, it was done with ink. And if you lined it through or tried to erase it, it was wrong. You should have waited and got it right the first time. I mean, he had a few little quirks to him, but one of the most godly men I've ever met. And uh, I'm so thankful for him. And the way he prayed in those classes was just amazing. Jesus was and is a man just like you and me, although he is the God man. He's 100% God, 100% man. And that man felt the need to pray for himself in verses 1 through 5. And then in verses 6 through 19, he prays for the immediate disciples that were with him at the time, especially the 12 as they were going to carry out his word. And yes, he did know that Judas was uh, not a saved man. He was God. Remember that? He knew he was not a man. Judas had never believed. You read in John chapter 6. 
and therefore his sins were never washed away. Jesus said about Judas in John chapter 13, verse 11, he knew who should betray him, therefore said Jesus, ye are not all clean. He knew that Judas was lost, and very clearly, in verse 18 of John 13, and we just talked about this, the fact that from God's standpoint, we were chosen to be his. He says in John 13, 18, I speak not of you all. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture might be fulfilled. He that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. And there Jesus is referring back to Genesis when he told, when God told Eve that one day, there would be one that would bruise um, the heel, and uh, Satan bruised the heel of Jesus, but Jesus stomped him. Amen. Jesus, Judas is a frightening example of how close somebody can be to the Lord, the kingdom of God, and miss it. One of the twelve. Now, in verses 6 through 19, he talks about the disciples. And then in verses 20 through 26, he talks about us. He's praying. This whole cha chapter is a prayer. And really, I think we ought to call this one the Lord's Prayer and the other one the model prayer. He, he said, when you pray, pray like this. It's a model prayer. But this one is really Jesus' prayer before he went to the cross. Now, let's read this. Remember, 1 through 5, he's praying for himself, 6 through 19 for the disciples and then 20 to the end of the chapter, he's praying for us. We are going to read it, and we are going to do a jet tour through this, and we'll only be in the air about 20 minutes. You ready? These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, and these four words are key, the hour is come. As you read through the Gospels over and over, Jesus keeps saying, Mine hour is not yet come. Mine hour is not yet come. Boom, right here, he's about to go to Calvary, and he says, the hour has come. And he asked God the Father to do something. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should be given, he should give eternal life. Now, boy, this is a statement here. Jesus is going to give eternal life to as many as God the Father has given him. See, these, these two persons and the Holy Spirit, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, have always known who's going to get saved. Always. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me, to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. This is before the creation. Well, what were they doing all that time? Well, there wasn't time. And the answer to your question is, I don't know what they were doing. Okay, we, we've only got knowledge about the, the last six a uh, thousand years or so, 6,500 years. So that's the end of Jesus praying for himself. Now he's going to pray for the disciples. I have manifested thy name to the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest the disciples to me, and they have kept thy word. Boy, he's got a forgiving spirit about those boys, doesn't he? They, they had all sorts of trouble. Now, they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me. Remember Jesus had said earlier, uh, he was, must be about the Father's business. And... He came to do the will of him that sent him, and he had done that with these 12 men. Uh, middle of that verse, uh, they have received him and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, 
but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine, and all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them the disciples. And now I am no more in the world, he's talking about leaving, but these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those twelve whom thou hast given me, that they may be unified, one, just like the Holy Trinity, as we are. And while I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name, those that thou gavest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost. Now, let's hold on just a minute here. He's taken into account what I just read to you about Judas. Judas was not one given to him. Okay, you might as well say, oh me, or amen right there. But he was, the ones you gave me I have kept, except but the son of perdition, Judas, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Now, I know in this passage he is specifically saying this about the disciples. But it's been my experience that people who are nasty and hateful and claim to be Christians might not be. Some of the greatest Christians that I've seen that fulfill this thing about joy are men and women who end up going through the, the, the rescue missions. They hit a hard spot in life. They got their mess straightened out. And the, they've got joy unspeakable and full of glory. Okay? Praise God for that. And such were some of you. Verse 14, I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. And are, why are we surprised that we're seeing the world hate the church right now in America? I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but thou shouldest keep them from the evil of the world. Now, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but how many of us have been praying recently, oh, Lord, come on back, get us out of this, okay? We want him to, but Jesus said, I'm not asking you that for that, Father. Keep them here. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Did Jesus making the importance of the word of God in this prayer. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. That ornery old cuss of a neighbor or that works with you where you are, it might come to your knowledge on the other side of this space in the Father's house that God actually put you around them to be a witness to them. And for their sakes I sanctify myself that they might also be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for, for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, which is all of us that followed the twelve apostles. That they all may be one. Christians should be unified. As thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one where? In us. And so there's a real sense in which Jesus was asking us to have the same tight relationship with God the Father that he did and that we'd all be so close spiritually that it'd almost be like we are part of the Trinity. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them that they may be one, even as we are one. Now, he, now he's talking about us. I in them, thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, talking about us, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory 
which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. Jesus actually praying that we're going to get a chance to see Jesus in his glorified appearance. Okay, the three, Peter, James, and John, sort of got to see that on the Mount of Transfiguration. And one of these days we will see him as he really is, and we will be like him. Amen. Amen. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these, us, have known that thou hast sent me, and I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. Now I want to tell you, just on the basis of Jesus' prayer, if God answers his prayer, Christians won't be hateful. Amen. Oh, I see I better pray about this one, okay? Lord, thank you for this chapter. And as we quickly go through it, help us to grab some principles. And maybe we just take a few days or a week and just read this chapter over and over and study it for its importance. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now, I've already pointed out verses 1 through 5, Jesus prayed for himself. He prayed for the disciples 16 through, 6 through 19, and he prayed for us from 20 to the end of the chapter. Now, the prayer reveals Jesus' priorities when he prayed. Now, I'm afraid sometimes our priorities, if we're not careful, is gimme, gimme, gimme. Okay? And, and I don't want to be sick. And I don't want my mother to be sick. And humanly, I don't want her to die, but the way things are right now, I'll be glad for her to be in the presence of the Lord. Okay. And if these things I got keep hurting, I, I'm ready to go too. I'm not getting a truckload up tonight, but I'm ready to go. But God's ready for us to stay here till he's ready for us to come up there. I want you to see some priorities in these, this prayer of Jesus. The first one is found in verse 1, and it is this. Father, the hours come, and then he issues a command. Do you see this? Glorify thy son. Jesus was anxious to be on the other side, but while he was here, he wanted his life to glorify God and be showing others that glory in his life. The second thing I want you to see is down in verses 21 to 23. Here he's praying for the unity of the church. Now, through the years, uh, this has been one of the strangest well, I better be careful how I say this. In a good sense, it's been one of the strangest churches I've ever been in because primarily the years, all the years I've been here, there's been un unity. Now, there's been a few scuffles along the way, but the scufflers disappeared because they couldn't be in unity. And we're still in love with God and God in love with us, and we're in love with each other. Amen. And you learn things every time you come to church. I never knew Charles had had a baby until tonight. <laughs> the unity of the church in verses 21 to 23. And then another thing that he shows us is the sanctity of the church in verse 17. These are priorities that Jesus was praying about that we would be clean. We're in the world, but we're going to stay clean. Now, from Winston-Salem up through Danville, Virginia, and over in this area somewhat, there's this wonderful soil composition known as red clay. And if it ever gets on your white socks, they're going to be orange socks for the rest of your life. Okay? God's asking us to be clean as he prays to the Father, and he wants us to be totally sanctified. Are you washed? We sing many times here in the blood. And then verses 18 through 19, he asks God the Father to help us win a lost world. Four priorities in the prayer of Christ. And this will make a study on its own. If you want to do it, it will be a whole sermon on its own. Glorifying the Father, the unity and sanctity in the church, those two things, and the winning of a lost world. That is what we're supposed to be about. In this chapter also reveals the gifts God has given to us. Now, uh, one of my pastor friends, and I won't 
I don't think any of you know him, but I'm still not going to call his name. I've noticed on his church Facebook page, and of course, when you follow stuff, you get the, the changes. And he said, now that we're getting into the fall months, on October the first Sunday, we're going to celebrate Easter that we missed back in the fall, in, the, in the spring because of the COVID thing. And on the second Sunday, we're going to celebrate Mother's Day. And on the third Sunday, we're going to celebrate Father's Day. And on the fourth Sunday, we're going to get the 4th of July. Well, they can do what they want to do. Uh, I think just in case things go bad for the election, we ought to have the Christmas in the end of October instead of Halloween. By the way, I'm already reading articles that are saying if you're waiting for stuff to show up at the stores, you better buy your stuff now online because they don't think that some of the companies are going to trust the stores to have sufficient credit to pay their bills. The big box stores. All I want is one of those fruitcakes from down at Bear Creek, south of us here. Hallelujah. I'm going to have to call Lula Dish. I said that one time in church, and every year for about eight years, she bought me one of those cakes. She didn't buy me the little small one so Beth and I could eat it in, in a couple of weeks, get that big old hoop one, and I ate it, being a sound mind. They're wonderful. Look at the gifts we get. Verses 2 through 3, God gives to us in verse 2. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that Jesus should give eternal life. I'm glad you've got that, and I've got that. It's a wonderful gift that he's given to us. In verse 8, I have given unto them the words which thou hast gavest me. And literally, Jesus is talking about the written word of God. In verse 14, he actually says, I have given them thy words word and because we took it the world hates us thirdly he has given to us in verse 22 his glory and the glory which thou givest me i have given them these are wonderful presents and gifts that god's given to us um, and then four different occasions i'll look at verse two uh, but it's three other times in this chapter he talks about the fact that we as believers are God the Father's gifts to Jesus. Thou hast given him power over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. Now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me. Charles leads us in that occasionally. We are the Father's gift to Christ and Jesus is the Father's love gift to us, John chapter 3, verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Our gift from God the Father is Jesus Christ. Now, there's just two more things I want to mention and we'll be, we'll be through. I told you it's a jet tour. There's a word that appears in this chapter 19 times. And it is the word world, W-O-R-L-D. This prayer, Jesus teaches us how to overcome the world. You know, we can live a successful Christian life in the midst of a near hell. Okay. On the way to church tonight, uh, Beth and I chit-chatting along. We're on... Uh, Old Julian Road, right before we get to Thackerdary Road and come between uh, Jacob's house and uh, neighbor Bud's. And I said to Beth, see that man out there, weed eating his yard? That's Jerry Branson. Jerry Branson is our county commissioner for this part of the county. And uh, Jerry claims to be a Christian. And I've talked to him several times, but he was the very guy that on this county commissioner's that voted to get out of the business, made the motion to get out of the business of telling churches how to, to operate. Amen. We can overcome the world by being friends of those who might be saved or not saved that are in high places. We must seek God's glory first in the first five verses of this chapter if we're going to overcome the world. We must experience his joy in verse 13. Jesus said, now I come to thee, to God the Father, and these things I speak in the world that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. 
We need to experience his joy. We need to be sanctified by the word in verse 17. We need to seek to win the lost in the world. And we need to encourage the unity of the church and God's people in the world. Now, we have to be careful just because somebody says they are a church that they really are. Some of them don't believe the truth, and some of them are not willing to stand for the truth, and we ought not to link up with churches like that. Okay, We ought to stand for those who believe the basic ten Bible doctrines that the Bible teaches us, and for years among Bible-believing Christians, there was a room for difference on the eschatology, the end-time events, but they, no matter which of those three positions you take, they all end the same. We need to be unified in the world as God's people for the sake of the world. So the world is key in this prayer. As Jesus prayed 19 times, he mentions the world. Another key word in this chapter is the word glory or some form of it, glorified as well. Christ laid aside his glory to come down here. And his glory was not seen except by the Peter, James, and John on the Mount of Transfiguration. God is a spirit, but a spirit with form. Our our loved ones that we've lost and who are believers are in the presence of the Lord, and they're not in their body right now. They're just in their spirit, but God's going to put that spirit in the body, resurrect the body, and change it in a moment in a twinkling of an eye to be just like the body of Jesus in a glorified way way and glory is a key word in this chapter and Jesus one of the last prayers we have of him before he went to the cross and died for us was that we would be glorified that's one of my favorite doctrinal truths about the doctrine of salvation is glorification and one of these days I know I'm not putting myself down now but you think I look good now you just wait I'm going to be something He talked about how when he was glorified when he was to be returned to heaven. Christ is glorified in the church in verse 10. He has shared his glory with the church in verses 22 and 24. And we already have the glory. But it's not been totally revealed yet. My spirit, my soul is saved. But my body has not been saved yet. And one of these days, he's going to wake it up and change it in the moment of the twinkling of the eye, and it's ready to be revealed. Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 18 to 21, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Now he's talking about at a time yet to come. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of, of the sons of God. When this takes place, it's going to take place all at once for all of us. Amen. And we're going to be somebody. Then it's going to be powerful to have a wonderful spiritual state like Jesus Christ. The creature was not made subject, was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. That is a wonderful, wonderful promise from Jesus Christ that he was praying in this chapter that absolutely would take place. If you do much studying of historical things, I know Pastor Bob, uh, sometimes I'm ashamed to see the stuff he's reading, uh, and I try to read a lot. This year has been difficult Uh, not just because of 2020, but for me, I can't pay attention because of all the pain with the surgery and therapy and recovery, and I'm just now getting to reading again like I have been reading, and uh, it won't be 60 60 books this year, okay? But if you study much and you study some of the reformers, there's one name that will come up, and it's the name John Knox. And John Knox was laying in his bed dying, And during the last weeks of his illness, he requested that somebody in the family would read John chapter 17 to him 
every day. What a benefit to realize what Jesus prayed for us if you only do those last verses that are about us. But all of them are important and they're given to us in the word of God to see the heart of Jesus and how he prayed for us then. And right now he's sitting at the right hand of the Father interceding for us and praying for us now. Amen. You know, just humanly speaking, Kathy, for me, it's good to know that Jesus is praying for my mother in her messed up state right now. And he's praying for you and praying for me. What a wonderful benefit we will get by studying this prayer more and more. What a treasury of truth that it is. I mean, we learn about the Trinity. We learn about the love of God, the plan of God before the foundation of the world world twice in this chapter it's a wonderful wonderful prayer and I hope you'll go back and just read it again sometime this week and be encouraged okay I want to be like the lion and the wizard of Oz I want courage courage and we can face whatever God allows to come in this world remember Jesus is praying for us in the election Jesus is praying for us in the threats that are coming out against us Jesus is praying for us, knowing what George Soros and his buddies are doing. Okay? I hope they're enjoying themselves because it won't be so good where they're going. Lord, thank you for this wonderful chapter of your prayer for us and for the disciples and even in your human form here with us praying for yourself. And what a great blessing it is to read it tonight and think about it for a few minutes. And I pray you'd help us to ponder this chapter more and find great courage and strength knowing that our older brother in the faith sitting at the right hand of God is still praying for us. And we thank you for that today. Help us to be like you in praying for others that are around us. Lord, we thank you for helping uh, John and Janet. Pray you continue to strengthen them. We pray for Dean and Geneva and Tina as they return home. We pray you continue to Help Charles with his eye procedure and Ray that's got it also to be cared for in his life. We pray to help Terry with that leg injury that should continue to strengthen her. Lord, we pray for mom. We pray for Kathy's mom that you'd meet their needs in this debilitated state of what they're dealing with. We pray for Michelle and that special request that she made earlier that you just meet the needs there, whatever that is. And then, Lord, as we go out this door tonight and start uh, another week that we call a work week on Monday that we would have in our heart and minds the same priorities that Jesus had of glorifying you in the world where we are of being a peacemaker and unity person in the church that will be clean in the church family and that we'll see the lost souls that are walking by us and we pray that you would just remind us of this chapter throughout this week. In Christ's name, amen. All right, have a good week, the Lord willing. If you need us, call. We'll do what we can. <laughs>